So now, without further delay, let's begin today's event, sponsored by Zoom Data and hosted by Information Management. It's my pleasure to introduce your moderator for today, and that is Eric Cavanaugh. Eric, you have the floor. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to I Am Live, our new webcast series with Information Management Magazine. What's bigger than big data? My goodness, the Internet of Things is going to be a massive source of big data. And I like to call big data a second chance for data because this is the real data that usually it's spinning off of devices or machines, sometimes from social media. But it's really a chance for us to get a better handle on what's actually happening in the world and then ideally do some meaningful analysis, discover some insights, and take some action to change what's going on. So we do archive all these webcasts for later viewing. Feel free to share them with your colleagues. There is a slide about yours truly and enough about me. We have two of my favorite people online today. We've got Mark Madsen from Third Nature. He's one of the best analysts in the business. He's one of these folks who actually builds solutions, so he's rolled up his sleeves on more than a few occasions to understand how technology works. And, you know, frankly, the, the world is getting more complex by the day, so he has to focus on what is happening in the world and staying on top of things, and we do that in part by these webcasts. We also have Ian Fife. He's a veteran software expert from uh, Zoom Data, which is a really fascinating company. Zoom Data has done an excellent job at being able to give visibility into very large data sets very, very quickly. I've seen several demos of Zoom Data over the past couple of years, and it's frankly amazing how swiftly you can move through layers of large data sets and get that nice strategic view at any given layer. So it's great for discovery. They also have some interesting things going on with partnerships. And we're going to learn today about what they're doing in the world of big data, and especially in the world of IoT. And so with that, I'm going to hand it off to Mark Madsen. Take it away. Thanks, Eric. Good morning, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so the topic for today is about uh, streaming data and Internet of Things. And um, since that's kind of a broad topic, and we have a fairly short period of time, I decided to veer away from the specifically technical and talk instead more about the, the nature of this kind of data and, and how to think about it since it's not the typical data. Um, so the, the kind of data that you know, we're talking about isn't uh, transactions where you enter something into a form and it gets written into a database. And then for analytic purposes, you go to that database and you pull it out and stash it somewhere else or look at it. Um, instead, we're talking about things that uh, typically are either broadcast on a network um, or uh, broadcast on a network and then recorded into a log file. Um, I'm going to ignore the log file piece because that's not really um, germane. That's just a place where it gets written to at some point. Um, so if you look at, at this, we're really talking about events, not transactions. And, you know, transactions, we, when we say that, we generally mean in a database and we have a number of characteristics. And, and events are different. And one of the, the core things, obviously, is that they, they're, we're talking about streaming data. The collection is not a static set that's at rest. It's, it's uh, events flowing across the network. And they have uh, two different things, right? They, they have a location, and they have a, a latency or a time span in which they live or in which they occur. So if you look at this chart, um, what you have on site inside a device, whether that be your smart blender or your car or something totally different like a know, machine on a factory floor, or a piece of IT software running your infrastructure. There is microsecond to millisecond um, execution time going on. Now, many of the times the events are just log events. This thing happened, or there's a sensor reading and it pulses every so often. And, um, you know, it could be fairly slow, like room temperature monitors, which might pulse on 30 to 60 second frequencies. Um, or it might be something which is down in the microseconds like your anti-lock brake sensors. And those things, uh, they, they create some little piece of data, some event, um, and then within a local loop, 
within a device that data is typically used. If we're not talking about pure logging for informational purposes, we're talking about events that are as sensor readings and actions taken, they will get uh, you know, generated, captured, analyzed, and, and affected locally to that device. And these things happen very rapidly. But then they get propagated onto a network in the case of of you know actual networks devices, at which point things get interesting because you might persist it, right? That first persistence at the beginning could be a uh, it could be uh, a log file, it could be a database, it could be a Hadoop cluster, uh, it could be further propagated out to other systems on the network because at this point it, it's floating on the wire, and depending on how you've configured things, anybody can read that event off the wire, and at that point, it may be analyzed um, and used for something. Sometimes it's just monitoring and it floats around. Other times, it's something that has to be looked at. Um, you know, you're looking for a threshold which is exceeded, which says my nuclear reactor is melting down. Um, at which point, you might do one of two things. Right, the point of the analysis is that there's nothing to deal with. There's no alert throw it away, or you elect some form of action. Um, and that action might be, you know, in a nuclear reactor, it's uh, throw the control rods down and your anti-lock brakes. It could be something else, um, like, you know, start pulsing the brake instead of holding the brake steady. Now, typically when those events occur and a machine itself has done something or a machine has told another machine to go do something, that event itself has to be persisted, right? Because there's been an action taken and you need to know that the actions are taken. And then that gets pushed back out. And if that gets sent to something else, of course, that, um, that effect that actually gets, uh, gets performed is, is uh, taking place. And that could be minutes later. And then there's this sort of escalation to the disconnected outside the network piece, which is starting to get into human time latencies now. You might escalate something to a person, and at that point you have an alert. The person sees it. They decide to do something. They pick from a set of actions to take, and those things, of course, get written as well. So you're recording the events, and then you're recording the actions that are taken because of the events. And you typically need to do all of that because you need to be able to close the loop on the analytics and make sure that you are recording uh, what happens on the basis of what is is uh, being informed and elected there. And sometimes it's coordination. There's nothing wrong with machines taking action solo, but you need human oversight if for nothing other than liability reasons. But sometimes it's that actions have to be coordinated across more than one system, across more than one department. Um, you know, depending on the scope of action, it might be go out to uh, go out to AWS and get more servers online. Um, so you have this, this sort of complex set of things where you've got very local, very immediate time, intermediate time floating on the network, and potentially hours later um, analysis or use of that data and actions taken. And it could happen local to the device where the data is generated. It could happen on the network somewhere between that device and some endpoint, or it could happen at a human's desktop. And so that is really the, the map of, of the, the events and their time scale. When you look at it, of course, there's all these different, um, different time scales. So of course, you know, when I said that it could be persisted or it could be forgotten or it could be forwarded. Sometimes you don't record data. When you have devices with lots of data, uh, they throw off tons of data. Do you really need it? You know, for example, if you have a hotel full of room sensors and you're holding a conference in that hotel, there are smart building systems that record all of the temperature and open and close the venting. And those systems really don't need all six temperature readings in that room to be persisted. Um, you can probably just average that temperature and record that. Or you could take those and record all six. It really depends on the nature of your problem as to whether you're going to keep this and for how long. If we uh, look at that, the, the purpose of it, of course, is that local control, those local decisions, and that latency at that local level. 
So it's all about what's happening right there. In the case of a sensor, they typically don't do anything. In the case of sensors and actuators, like anti-lock brake systems, of course, there's a lot more. So if we took as an example um, those giant windmill um, turbines, um, you know, these things have these immense, you know, 100 foot or longer uh, blades, and they are like propellers, but they are adjustable. And so every revolution that a wind turbine blade goes around, there's a number of sensors that track the position, the pitch, the angle that this blade is sitting at, and make very small adjustments. And they're doing that on the basis of, of uh, strain gauges and uh, other sensors and you know, other things that are coming from the outside. But there are these microcontrollers that, that deal with this. And so each blade has these things, and there are small controllers in the system that control small bits of it. But when you look at that, of course, there's that second context, which is um, where multiple of these things get correlated. So, you know, in the case of a wind turbine, there are potentially three blades on there for most of the standard ones that are out there. Um, there's a little bit more complexity. There are more rules. And you're talking about external monitoring. So you're talking about watching or affecting actions outside of a device in this case. So if we look back at that turbine, the larger context is this whole piece of machinery, which has hundreds or thousands of sensors and effectors and actuators built into it. And so those blades are just small components. So all these small components get put into larger assemblies. What that means is that there's a different level that you are monitoring, where you're looking at microcontrollers and low latency effects and just one angle adjustment per revolution of the, of the uh, whole propeller there. Um, that's all at the blade level. And there's not much history. There's not much, much uh, real detailed net information there. But then you're looking at a network level, right? You've networked all of these things together or you've tied them all together. And now you're looking at lower level aggregates. You're combining these things. And you're looking at, say, what's the tower output here? What's the overall performance? Um, it's still low latency. You're going to watch this fluctuating power output, the performance per revolution, but you're going to also watch over longer time spans than the immediate device microcontrollers. And then there are longer term aspects. So you could take the history of this and say, well, the power output from this tower seems to fluctuate over time. Maybe there's something wrong with it. Maybe it needs maintenance or adjustment, or maybe it's a sign that one of the propellers is going bad because in these towers, the single most uh, common failure is for one of those propellers to break. And when those propellers break, typically the tower falls over, so it's not a good thing. Um, so you have different event types now, right? You're mixing event aggregates and combinations and derivations. So you take these things and you bring them together and you add this metric to that metric, or you do a calculation, and that little piece of data becomes a piece of data that you float out onto the network because that's what you monitor. You don't monitor 100 microcontrollers, you monitor this one derived metric, and that's what's going to feed the monitoring system that monitors um, that tower. And then if you take the, these things and look at the broader context of human intervention, um, <clears throat> diagnosis, analytic tasks, things that have to be coordinated, then we're talking about a much longer loop in which people are involved, in which information is stored, often in databases or other places, and persisted in a different way, to give you the level of monitoring that says, well, here's my farm. So I have a wind farm, and you know I've got hundreds or even thousands of these things scattered around it. So now I'm really monitoring the equivalent of a generation plant, except that in a wind farm, each one of these is like a tiny little generation plant. So now you're looking at the total energy output, the total site performance. You're monitoring the whole farm as a unit, which means that you are aggregating a lot of measurements, which themselves are probably aggregates of lower level things. And your actions are much bigger and coarser and probably more human controlled. Start turbines, stop turbines, take these down for maintenance. Um, there's a different focus. There's different actions. And people are probably much more likely to be taking action at this level than machines. And of course, there's going to be a lot of history there, but less overall data, because you wouldn't persist every single tiny little ele element of, of the event stream. You just persist the ones that you care about for monitoring purposes. 
So what you have, in effect, is multiple places for data to live. Uh, there's local cache on controllers and devices. There is the data that flows around on a network in and between these things. And there is data which is persisted as history and used in different time scales and for different purposes. And that's normal, and that's the way it should be. You shouldn't expect that all of your data goes to one place and then flows back out. Um, typically, all of your human-analyzed data will end up in one or more repositories. Um, and so this means that when you look at your data architecture, you have the piece that is streaming or live. You've got pieces of in-memory cache or very low latency databases, you know, things like Cassandra, for example, is a internet-enabled uh, cloud data store that has extremely fast read-write latencies. Um, and, and so you persist it, uh, you know, in caches and queues, and then you go into more persistent storage platforms like that, which can be on the one end very low latency or on the other end really slow. Um, you know, typically database latencies, they're fast in transaction processing terms, but they're not fast at enormous scale terms. And so you're going to have you know, data living out there, and you have to think about how do you unify these things, because if you're looking at streams and then you're looking at history um, to diagnose something that's happening in the stream, you need access to all of these, and you need them consistently accessible. And when you think about the architecture that you've built, in, in streaming, the data um, isn't sitting somewhere for you to extract. The data is just flowing, and you have to get it. So the data comes to you. It is a push system rather than a pull system, like most data warehouses and ETL. And then you think about the uses that this, um, that this is put to. And I would say that there's really two loops here, uh, or, or two categories. There's the decision action sort of uh, model, which is how we think of things in BI terms, which is I'm going to look at stuff, and there's informational output that goes to a human who makes decisions like, should we add more turbines to the wind farm? Um, there are human decisions which moderate things. You know, so the power systems that manage this may determine whether or not to bring up or, or um, take down um, turbines in that wind farm but maybe there is human governance over this because you don't want the machines to do this. So they, they act, they do things, they coordinate, and humans coordinate them. And then, of course, there's what's been popular for a long time now in the CEP space, which is decision automation. You know, people set the goals and the constraints, and they monitor the performance of the machine. That's what the machine's doing, the outcomes based on the elections of activities. Right? And all of those are streaming events as well. And then the other side of things is this monitor alert version of, of uh, stream analytics where you're just monitoring things, like a dashboard, but it's a constantly streaming dashboard, which probably has derived metrics. It's got metrics that are taken off of three completely distinct event streams and combined, um, sort of like a join in a database. You know, there is no database. How do you do joins when you have events? Tricky problem if you're writing code. Uh, and then you've got the machine monitoring side, which is just purely machines and software talking to each other. And there you have these two things. You've got uh, detection models that are watching for anomalies, watching for variances, watching for specific rules to be triggered, and models for action. Like Mark just bought something on a credit card in California, and Mark bought something on a credit card in Germany simultaneously. That isn't possible, so there must be something wrong, so we need to block it, and that's kind of like the fraud detection rules that you see in, in uh, financial operations. But they have similar time windows in which they, they have to operate. You know, so, for example, if you're looking at human decision support, you could look at things like fleet telematics and trucks, uh, the, the kind of analysis you're probably familiar with already in, in any kind of uh, BI environment. But when you start thinking about moderating human decisions, or I'm sorry, machine decisions, um, there's all kinds of interesting stuff going on. It's not purely you know, de devices and trucks and power machinery. Spotify playlists are actually machine uh, recommendations. And the machine recommendations are then fired off into uh, uh, human space. And in part, they're generated by people, and they are curated by humans. So we have multiple things going on. Um, and then in decision automation, uh, there are rules like um, you know, insurance ratings and, and bank loan approval and, and uh, 
recommendation engines for media, uh, for commerce, like cross sell and upsell engines. And there, the machine is taking an action totally independent of a person. You might monitor it, but there's no way you're injecting a person into the process to say, no, don't do this one, do that one. That's what the recommender is doing for you inside that network behind that website or call system or wherever it lives. On the operational intelligence side, these sort of autonomic processes that just run, you can think of uh, intensive care unit monitoring. It used to be, well, it still is in a lot of places, that nurses and doctors have to monitor each machine distinctly. And now there's a lot more smart monitoring that pulls all of these things into one place and also correlates things. You know, because a spike in blood pressure is not a big thing, but a spike in blood pressure and an increase in pulse and an increase in temperature might be something significant. And so you have this sort of combined monitoring that goes on in things like healthcare. Something very low latency is reputation management. There's a hundred different services out there that monitor brands and companies and look at what's going on with their online reputation. And so they're pulling social media data, blog posts, Twitter feeds, Facebook posts in um, near real time. As these events flow, they're analyzing the text and they're feeding it in to see what's going on. And that's called reputation management, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, and PR firms and PR groups within organizations use that to see what's going on, just like your IT operations monitors its equipment. And then, of course, there's the machine monitoring stuff. Um, you know, predictive maintenance is thrown around a lot. So there's all kinds of things that, that happen in that machine, pure machine monitoring loop. And so, um, you know, there's these different uses, and so you have to think about what category of use that you're in and how the data flows and what your data architecture should be. And so I'm going to stop there and turn it over to Ian to get a little more uh, tactical on these things with uh, his part talking about the IoT landscape. Okay, thanks, thanks, Mark, and hey, everybody, this is Ian from Zoom Data. So yeah, just to add to some of the examples uh, Mark was describing there, yeah, I think we all know more and more devices are being connected to the internet, you know, th and that's really the, the thing we call the internet of things. So as consumers, you know, at my home, I, my light bulb are connected, I've got internet routers, I've got my fitness tracker, I've got my smartphone, and then obviously for companies, you know, in manufacturing, all of their manufacturing equipment, their industrial sensors are being connected to the internet. Um, even you know, in our environment, our roads are being more and more connected to the internet. So we can see you know, traffic slowdowns, traffic jams, that kind of thing. So you know, kind of needless to say, but this is just a hugely growing area. Um, and here's a few statistics around um, what a couple of organizations. The first one is Gartner. So as of last year, they estimated there were around 6.3, 6.4 billion uh, devices connected to the internet. And uh, they're forecasting by 2020 to three years from now that we'll have around 21 billion devices uh, you know, IoT devices. Um, here's a similar survey from uh, Business Insider. They're, they're a little bit more optimistic. They're forecasting around 24 billion, and that's a compound growth of 41 percent, 41 percent per year. So this is just a, you know, we, we we basically haven't seen anything yet. This is going to be just uh, getting much bigger as time goes on. And BI Insider also ranked that businesses are really the number one adopter um, followed by government. And actually number three, I didn't list it here, is consumers in terms of adoption. So, you know, we all think we're doing a lot in our personal lives, but in fact, it's more focused on, on business and government. All right, so I want to kind of talk more about the, the challenge of doing analytics on, on, on IoT. You know, Zoom Data, we're an analytics company, um, and we specialize uh, partly in doing um, streaming analytics, and part of that is IoT analytics. And I want to talk about some of the challenges about doing that with, with traditional tools. Um, now, one thing Mark talk, uh, touched on is the fact that, you know, when you've got data streaming in, um, often you want to do, uh, you need to land that data. You need to do historical comparisons. So you may have data coming in in real time right now, and you want to compare that to a minute ago, an hour ago, yesterday, last week, last month, last quarter, you know, last year. So not, not saying you need to land all of that data. And as Mark talked about, you know, you, you typically want to pick the data points, maybe aggregate the data points, but ultimately you are going to be landing that data. And typically you're going to need a fairly scalable and high performance uh, data store to land that data. So, you know, typically you're not going to be using a traditional SQL database. Um, they're, they're not really designed for that kind of streaming, you know, data to be coming in a real time and then handling real-time queries. But we're talking more about technologies like MemSQL, which is an in-memory in database technology. 
And then other more modern data sources like Kudu, um, like Acebase, um, like Spark. Um, so those kind of more modern scalable technologies which, which handle this fast moving or high velocity data uh, in a more effective way. And they also let you query the data at the same time as you're loading the data. So that's kind of the first challenge. Um, the second challenge is on the front end. You want to make sure the, the uh, analytics tool you're using lets you interact with that data. So it lets you do things like play, play back, rewind, fast forward. So you can actually, again, compare what's happening right now with, what we were, with what's happened in the past. You can kind of get that context. Um, and the other really important thing is the ability to combine data. So maybe your data coming from multiple sources and you want to have on a single you know, dashboard. You've got um, data, you know, real-time data combined with historical data. And maybe also combining data with, with uh, internet, uh, sorry, combining streaming data with reference data. So, for example, you may have reference data describing your products, describing your, your customers, that kind of thing. So, it's really important to be able to kind of blend that data on the fly as, as it comes in. And then the, the other part of the requirement, I would say, is around the ability to have a streaming analytics engine to actually query that data and then visualize the data. And this really forces you to adopt a new model. I mean, you can't do the old model of issue a big query and wait. It could take a few seconds or even a few minutes to run. That's not going to work in the, in the streaming world. So we take an approach of, of what, we do, what we call micro queries, um, where we break down larger queries into tiny queries. And each one of those tiny queries is typically going to run very, very fast, you know, well, sub-second at, at the most a couple of seconds, depending on the data volumes you're dealing with. And then, you know, as those, as those queries run on the front end, you're visualizing, you're, you're basically updating that display uh, in, in real time as, as a, each one of those micro queries runs. So essentially, you, you deem this kind of streaming engine at the heart of your analytics uh, capability. Um, and then the final one, I, I also just touched on this actually a minute ago, is on the flight data blending. So again, you, you know, IoT data is not going to be everything. Typically, you're going to need to combine that data with reference data, and that reference data is often stored in a more traditional relational SQL database, like an Oracle, a MySQL, a Postgres, that kind of thing. Um, and it may be hybrid. You know, maybe your IoT data you're storing in some kind of cloud data store on Amazon or Google, but your customer reference data is stored in, you know, uh, some kind of CRM application, which may be on premise. So you need the ability to blend that data both on on prem and in the cloud, or maybe in a, in a hybrid uh, environment. So that's kind of the, the high level uh, requirements. Um, just looking a little bit about traditional you know, BI tools. Um, essentially, that you know the, the summary here is they were not built for this world of IoT streaming data. Um, you know they, they're built to do more uh, visualization and analytics against more static data stores, which are maybe updated. You know, typically overnight, um, or at most, maybe a few times a day, every couple of hours. But they certainly cannot do, you know, at the second level updates. So they're just not built for that. You know, you can have a dashboard which maybe updates every minute or two, but that's not going to really, you know, be cut it for, for when you're doing streaming analytics. The other thing I would mention is a lot of those tradi more traditional BI tools, they, they want you to, to do a couple of things. They want you to aggregate the data, and they want you to – to do that in a data warehouse or data mart. So you're essentially copying that data. Uh, and again, that's not going to work in a streaming world. Um, you, you haven't got time to be doing kind of on-the-fly aggregation, copying of data. That data is always going to be out of date if you, if you try and take that approach. So you need to be really uh, doing the analysis on, on that data in real time as it comes in. So essentially, you know, I could get into more details here, but you know, those traditional BI tools were not built for this world of streaming analytics. You know, they've tried to retrofit a couple of things, but it, it really just doesn't cut it. So what is the solution? Um, so I think these are the characteristics. If you're, if you're looking to do IoT analytics, um, I already mentioned this. The first thing is you need a, a streaming a query engine, which is going to connect to your high-performance data store. So wherever you, you chose to land that data, uh, you want to make sure you know, it, it can land the data at high speed, and then it's going to support high-speed query of that data uh, through a micro-query uh, query engine. And then on the front end, those visualizations are going to be refreshing on the fly. So you'll, you'll see literally you know, bars moving, dots moving as, as new data comes in second by second. Um, so you know, this is actually a screenshot of Zoom data, but just to give you an idea of the kind of capability we believe people uh, need with, it, with, with IoT analytics, this is our data DVR. So this, uh, by default, you're looking at data in real time. So this, is, this, again, this, this visualization is going to be refreshing second by second, there's typically going to be about a half second to maybe one second latency. This kind of can bring up 
you know, discussions about the meaning of the word real time. Um, you know, we find that for most organizations, most companies, that kind of half second to one second latency is, is totally acceptable. You know, there are obviously use cases, as, as you know, Mark mentioned, things like, you know, the nuclear reactor, you know, kind of example where that's not going to be acceptable. You need to be at the millisecond. And that's not what, what we're trying to achieve here. You know, we're, we're basically doing very, very near real time uh, uh, streaming analytics at that kind of half second to second latency. So using this data DVR capability, you know, right now I'm in live mode. I can take the slider down the bottom of the screen here on this yellow bar, and I can rewind through history. I can look at a minute ago, an hour ago, you know, last week, last quarter. And then I can fast forward. I can fast forward in, you know, 10x, 100x, you know, where every, for example, every hour's worth of data is going to be represented by, by one second in, in fast forward mode. So it, get, get, you know, it kind of compresses that data, gives you that feel of, of, as to what's happening over, over time without needing to sit there you know, for a long time looking at the screen. Um, so yeah, um, just moving on here. Another important thing is obviously it needs to be super easy to use. Now, you know, most tools are going to claim this, um, but you know, tools have evolved from 10, 15 years ago. There's you know, much more modern contemporary user experience expectations and uh, you know, people don't don't, don't, don't want to go on a training class to, to learn how to use your, your uh, analytics tool. They just want to sit down and start using it, you know, have context menus and so on. So we've designed this to be super easy to use. It's usable on a tablet device, you know, through a touch screen as well as on a, a more traditional laptop, you know, through a web browser. And the other thing I'd mention is embeddable. You know, very often these kinds of uh, analytics are going to be embedded inside of other business processes and, and business applications. So you want to make sure all, all of this stuff is fully embeddable. All right, just to kind of wrap up here, I've been actually moving through this uh, content surprisingly quickly, but we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. But just wanted to show you a couple of uh, screenshots. Unfortunately, we aren't able to do a live demo on this session. But you know, here's, a, here's a screenshot of Zoom data, again, showing that the data DVR capability. So if I was running this in live mode, this, this, uh, this dashboard would be, would be refreshing. You know, again, at the subsection level, you would see, you know, all of these visualizations updating on the fly. And you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, it says live. And then I can pause it. I can click on pause here. I can drag the uh, slider bar on the yellow bar at the bottom here. And I can rewind through history. And, it, and using these controls on the lower left, I can put it into fast forward mode again, where you know, every hour is, is, of data is, is going to rep be, be represented by a second, that kind of thing. Um, and also it lets you do um, kind of time relative type aggregation, you know, where maybe you want to look at last quarter, last year, that kind of thing. So that's the streaming analytics piece of it. Um, the other thing I mentioned is really important is the ability to blend data on the fly. Um, now here at Zoom Data, we, we uh, enable blending. We're actually built, built on top of Spark as our in-memory compute engine, you know, Spark being a very scalable um, engine and also, you know, great for streaming data. You can, you can update it on the fly. Um, it's very much built for that. So it makes it very easy as that IoT streaming data comes in to, to blend it with reference data, uh, blend it with other data sources, and then that blended data will, will be visualized in, through your visualizations and dashboards. And that's exactly what we're doing here. We're, uh, in this case, we're, we're blending data from MySQL, which is reference data, with data sitting in, in Impala um, in, in a Hadoop uh, environment. And then the final example here is high, high data volume analytics. Now, when you've got streaming data coming in, even if you're aggregating, you're typically going to end up with a lot of data. You know, you know you've got a lot of data if you're talking about billions of rows. And traditional BI tools, uh, again, just not built for that world of, of billions of rows of data. They were, they were built, architected 10, 15 years ago when people were wanting to store and analyze transactions, uh, not events. You know, when you're talking about events in the IoT world, you're talking about probably two to three orders of magnitude greater data. So definitely you're going to be getting into billions, tens of billions, even we've seen you know, customers with, with hundreds of billions of rows of data. So uh, you want to make sure you know, your BI technology is built for that world of, of big data, um, which is kind of, as I say, kind of goes hand in hand with streaming data. So again, this is where we take our streaming engine here at Zoom Data, and we, we, we use micro queries, and we, we call the approach data sharpening. So Sitting here, I could have a 100 billion row data set. This dashboard is going to render in uh, maybe two to three seconds. Now, it won't be precise immediately. It'll be an approximation because we'll, we'll be running little micro queries. And each one, as more and more of those micro queries run, we'll start to sharpen the results. It's a little bit like um, 
you know, when you're streaming video or uh, photos on, on a very slow internet connection, you know, it starts off fuzzy and the longer you wait, the, the sharper it gets. And that's kind of the approach we take to doing uh, uh, visualization on, on very large data volumes at that, that scale. Okay, so well, hopefully that gave you a good idea of uh, the approach that you know, we take here at Zoom Data to, uh, to doing streaming analytics and uh, as well as big data analytics. So Eric, over to you. Yeah, and I'd like to go ahead and throw this slide up here again. I think it's a great visual for our conversation here. And, and Ian, I'll throw this one out to you. I've tried to find a good way to describe what Zoom Data does. And for me, the whole concept of a scope comes into mind. Of course, a scope can power anything from a microscope to a periscope to a telescope. And to me, Zoom Data has really focused on enabling that highly uh, malleable scope that you can use to drill down through the different layers of data and understand each layer, and then from the visual perspective, allow you to piece together the component parts to see the big picture and, and to try to start analyzing data. Does that make sense? It, it, it does, and yeah, maybe I should have mentioned that. You know, that obviously there is a concept of drill through or drill down. So, you know, all of this data can be dimensional. So, um, you know, you can drill down through product hierarchies, customer hierarchies, that kind of thing. And then ultimately you can drill down to individual transactions. So if you see some anomaly, you know, that happen uh, in your real-time streaming data, you can actually drill down to the individual transactions which made up that, that anomaly. So absolutely. And you can do that, you know, it's not obvious here because we're looking at a static screenshot, but all of this stuff is basically clickable. I can click on any bar, any pie segment, any line, any state here in the map, and I can drill down to underlying details down to the individual transaction level, or in the case of IoT data, down to the individual event level. Sure, and, and to me, that's really where the value comes through, because if you get stuck at some abstracted layer, then you have to go ask someone in IT to build out a cube or to give you access to some set of data. Now the whole process of analysis becomes truncated, so if you have that capacity to drill down multiple layers and then go sideways, as you suggest, and even go down to that granular level, now you've got a useful tool for exploring what happened. You, you start at the strategic level. You know there's something wrong. You start exploring, going down through different layers into different systems. And sooner or later, if you can go all the way, that's when you're going to find whatever it is that caused the anomaly or whatever it is that caused what appears to be a trend. And it's at that point that the business person can make a decision and make an informed decision about how to change something, right, Ian? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, one of our goals is you don't have to rely on IT. You know, most traditional BI tools, you've got to set up this pretty heavyweight, what they call semantic metadata model. You've got to kind of manage, uh, model your schema, you know, because you're running on top of a relational database. And that can take time. That can take days and weeks to do. And every time you want to make a change, you've got to go back to IT. And it's going to be very cumbersome. So we've taken the approach that we want to uh, enable business users to do this on their own. So they can essentially set up uh, Zoom data on their own. Now, we do have a concept of a metadata model, but we, we make it optional. You do not have to do it. You can just connect to a data source, and you can start visualizing that data. If you want to prettify it, you know, rename things, if you want to build calculated fields, absolutely, you can do that through our, our modeling capability. Yeah, but Mark, I'll bring you in on, on this one. I thought you did a great job of demonstrating a couple key aspects of the situation here, one of which being the disparity of latency, whether it's machine to machine or human to machine, et cetera, but also this concept of different types of data in different types of pools and environments. You know, if you think about how the industry of business intelligence and analytics has evolved over the past 20 years, well, the data that we examined 20 years ago was a lot simpler, I would have to say, maybe with the exception of life sciences, for example, but we had data in relational models. It was fairly known what those structures looked like. Uh, now we have a much more varied topography to deal with, especially with IoT, where you have large amounts of, of fairly acute data, I guess is how I'd put it, and you're trying to get a picture of how that fits into a much bigger, more complex world. And for that reason, I think what Zoom Data has put together here is a very powerful mechanism for scoping, for telescoping or for microscoping into specific areas to be able to find what you need in this very complex, multivariate world. But what do you think? 
So there's a couple of things. You know, there's, um, like you said, there, there's multiple places where data can live, and it's going to live in those places in different latencies. And so, you know, for the human in the loop part, you're going to need a tool that can hit data in multiple data stores potentially. Um, you may be, uh, like Ian described, um, they're they expect a recording of data into a low latency data store. You know, maybe it's a cloud data store, maybe it's a database, it depends on your, your needs. But then there's also a historical data store. And um, most tools, like BI tools, um, analysis tools, were designed under the assumption of data at rest. And so the internals of the tool architecture are that there's a server and a semantic layer and some form of database behind it. And the, the problem is if you're watching a stream or you're watching a low latency stream cache, um, you are constantly refreshing that data. So you're probably talking then to some, some something that's a little different than a relational database. Uh, you're either talking directly to a network queue or a data store. Um, but if there are anomalies, if it's the sort of human mediated dashboard or uh, alert mechanism, you are probably looking at what's happening right now. You might look at other things that are happening right now. So there, there might be one or more different areas you're looking at. Typically, in the tooling environment we've got, that's one class of tool. If you then want to see what happened 15 minutes ago, because things don't just happen out of nowhere, there's probably been a trend towards a deviation that you have been alerted on. And so you have to go back. How do you go back and forth across that? Well, your tool has to be able to bridge both the historical data store and what's going on right now and stitch those together seamlessly. Otherwise, you're telling people, well, first you look here, and then you flip the policies and procedurals manual to page 57, and you look <laughs> over in this place, and you know another 10 minutes have gone by, at which point your reactor's melted down um, or your car's in a ditch, right? So. <laughs> It, there's this, um, these new sets of requirements aren't purely, oh, we talk to low latency stores or like they're saying, you know, we do micro queries or we talk to queues. It, it's how do you blend these two things together so that you can dip back into the history and play back what happened 15 minutes ago up to the present or do a BI style query that goes to a different place and looks at data, you know, that requires a, a new model tool architecture, and that's part of why you're seeing new products on the market. The old products are just fundamentally incapable of doing that type of thing. Yeah, and I guess, Ian, I'll bring you back in on this one. You know, this whole concept of at scale is the big issue of the day, and it's it's a driving force that has changed the nature of software architectures, to Mark's point. And I think that you guys at Zoom Data had that in mind when you built out the solution, right? You understood that we're facing a deluge of data from many more different kinds of sources, and the fact is the business models are getting more and more complex, especially any kind of organization that's going to leverage IoT, for example, or even any web-enabled business model at all is going to have to be built for durability and for scale. And, and that was a big part of what went into the calculus for how Zoom Data was built, right? Uh, that's, that's absolutely right. You know, you've probably all heard that, the, you know, one of the popular definitions of big data is the three Bs, you know, volume, velocity, and variety. And that's exactly what we had in mind, you know, when, when we architected Zoom Data to handle huge volumes of data, you know, which traditional tools just struggle with. They take minutes and hours to, to run those monolithic queries, and then velocity, which is streaming data, which is what we've been talking about today, you know, that data coming in in real time or near real time, and then variety where you've got you know, maybe unstructured data or semi-structured data like log files and social media posts and that kind of thing, and then the other part of it is blending data from multiple sources on the fly, but not needing to build a data warehouse or data mart, and that's really the approach we've taken to, uh, to having, you know, having a modern BI tool, which is very different from what was, you know, most of the tools on the market today, which were built 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, okay. Yeah, and I, I think you also were, were pretty clever to focus on the micro-query concept 
owing, if nothing else, to attention spans these days. You know, we live in a very fast-paced world, and uh, I think what's interesting these days is how consumer preferences and consumer behavior is increasingly driving the design of enterprise software. Even big Goliaths like SAP have really gotten the, the religion and have figured out that they need to have a much more attractive UI. They need to be catering to the speed of business and the speed of the worker. So I think just from a practical perspective, the fact that when you're using Zoom data, you, you submit your query and you start getting results back immediately, that's, that's great news for engagement with the user. That means the user is going to sit there and watch and learn something instead of getting distracted and going off and doing something else, right? That, that's absolutely right. You know, there's been many studies which have done, which have shown that if, if a, a query tool, a visualization tool takes more than about five seconds, people just stop using it. Um, they just get too frustrated. And really the goal needs to be sub-seconds. Um, and that's certainly you know, our goal, even on very large data volumes. We want, we want people to see results immediately. And particularly, you know, with the younger generation coming up where, you know, the millennials were all used to going on Google and you type in a, a search and you get instantaneous results. It may, you know, it may return a million pages, but you're not waiting for that. You, you know, it renders page one instantaneously. And that's kind of the approach, you know, we, we want to take to doing analytics on, on big amounts of data. You get instant gratification. You get an approximate result. If you want to wait a little bit longer, that, that result may get, get better. It may get sharper. Um, but you know you don't have to wait. You can actually get a get the kind of gist of of the results, um, get a feel for the results, and then you can drill down, as we talked about earlier on, drill down. You know, look at the transactions underneath that, and so on. So it just speeds up the whole f workflow of doing analytics and getting getting insights, which is really what this is all about. At the end of the day, you know, we, we analyze data in, in order to get insights, so we can run our companies more efficiently and make and make better decisions. Yeah, that's right. We have a great uh, a question from an attendee who is asking about the dashboards. And can a business person really stitch together these dashboards, or do they need to call someone with IT? Who winds up building them usually? Is it a business person, a, a power user? And what about scripting language? Is there a scripting language that gets woven into that as well? Uh, absolutely no scripting language. This is designed to be completely drag and drop through a web browser. And I would say, you know, typically, you know, whoever configures uh, the system Zoom data will, will maybe set up a few dashboards as kind of starting points, but absolutely this is intended for a, for a regular business user without training to better build their own dashboard. They just drag and drop, you know, the fields of, of data, and then they can choose the visualization type. Um, in Zoom data, everything is a dashboard. You know, it could be a single visualization dashboard, which looks just like a chart or a graph, or you can add, you know, multiple elements to that dashboard, and then it becomes, you know, a multi-element dashboard. And it can obviously include tables of data as well, um, and then very easy to configure, you know, drill, through, drill downs and drill throughs as well. Um, so yeah, absolutely doesn't require you to depend on a technical person to set this up for you. You know, you after it, after the initial the uh, systems initially set up, you know, it's really self-service from that point forward for the end users. Yeah, that that's good news again for engagement. And Mark, I'll throw this one over to you. I know you've done a lot of research over the years into visualization and, and frankly, human interaction, the mind working with data visualizations and, and how we perceive things based upon how they're shown. And I'll get back to this very clever strategy of Zoom data with the micro queries and showing you imagery immediately and then sharpening that data as the queries come in. I have to think that by doing so, they're really fostering a much deeper integration, if you will, or much deeper um, uh, association with how the brain works. And I think that, you know, when you think about the world of analyst business, analysts have to sit there and think about stuff. So it's, I, I'm not worried that machines are going to take our jobs anytime soon. I think machines are just going to be helping us get our jobs done more effectively and, and be more interesting, quite frankly. But I like the way this this dashboard or these um, these visualizations incrementally build out for a variety of reasons, one of which is because it keeps the users engaged. And if an analyst is engaged, that means he or she is doing their job and they're going to have a better chance of coming up with insights because insights require a lot, of, a lot of work, a lot of thinking. And if you have that stimulation from the visual 
perspective of your data, I think that fosters a better result. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. Um, typically, the time to hold attention is sub three seconds. So if you're not showing something on a screen that is a result of somebody's action between two to three seconds, um, you know, that's your cutoff after which um, your brain, you know, the subconscious part, not even the conscious part of your brain, um, starts to wander away from, from that thing. And so uh, immediacy actually takes a little bit of precedence there. So the idea that you can show something immediate and then kind of refine it. So it may not be exactly right, but it's close. It, it does two things. One is that it gives you the immediacy so that your attention doesn't wander. And the other is that actually, if it is increasing its resolution, it, um, it holds your attention a little bit too. So it keeps you engaged in the task. So there are, you know, two things happening there from a cognitive perspective. And, um, yeah, you know, it's kind of a an interesting way of of addressing that problem when you've got really large amounts of data. You know, your only other option is is essentially sample inquiries or approximate queries. Yeah, and I guess Ian, I'll throw one last question over to you. As we in, in the mark, there's time you can comment on this as well. You know, streaming data is, it represents such a fascinating shift in a how we view the world. B, how we design software, and C, how we make decisions. And I think it is always going to be important to have the historical context such that you understand what the streaming data means. But nonetheless, streaming analytics in particular has become such a hot topic in part because we live in such a real-time world. And if you wait too long, to Mark's comment earlier, you're going to have a nuclear meltdown or you're going to have your car in a ditch or something bad is going to happen. There are certain use cases, and they're growing by the day, that simply require real-time perspective from the analyst view. And so, Ian, I guess that's one of the keys, again, with the design point for Zoom data is you guys saw that coming, and you realize that you know, there's plenty of tools for dealing with traditional static data or data at rest. But the real big use case now, again, in part because of IoT, in part because of just web-enabled commerce and media, frankly, is going to be streaming data. And so that was a big part of, of what went into your design strategy for Zoom data, right? Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's absolutely right. Yeah, we, you know, as, a, as I say, from day one, yeah, we built Zoom data on top of a streaming analytics engine. So everything we do, even if you're connecting, it sounds a little bit weird, but even if we're connecting to a, a static data store source um, containing historical data, we're still doing streaming queries um, because we... We don't want people to sit there waiting for the query to, to, to finish. So we do these micro queries, you know, AKA streaming queries. Um, in, in every case, it doesn't matter whether it's a streaming source or, or a static source. Um, and I think one of the important things you kind of mentioned in your you know, introduction there was is the ability to blend that historical data with with the real time data. We we see that as, as as really important. You know, there are some streaming analytics uh, capabilities out there where they they direct. They directly connect to the data stream. You know, if you're using Kafka or Spark streaming, um, and that's great because you're going to get that data just a you know a fraction of a second faster by connecting directly to the to the streaming engine. But the problem is there, you don't really have the historical context. You know, maybe Kafka is buffering the last you know few minutes of data at the most, maybe the last hour or two, but you're not going to get that that full historical context, uh, which we believe is really critical for. But understanding you know, that that data you're, you're looking at right now, and that's why we kind of believe in this architecture of of landing that streaming data in a high performance data store, and then doing your streaming analytics as you land the data in real time. Yeah, and real quick, Ian, you know, you're a veteran of the open source community back from the Pentaho days, and maybe you could just comment on this fascinating movement of open source and how it really is enabling a new generation of technologies because, of course, Spark comes from Apache Spark. It's an open source project for the Apache Software Foundation. And all, all, just a whole host of these projects get out in, into the world, and then companies can leverage them. So as you suggest, you've built this on top of the Spark engine. Isn't that just amazing that we can have all this collaboration around foundational technologies that enable really powerful software, right? 
Yeah, you're right. I've worked in open source software for like the last 15 years. Um, so it's been a big part of my life. And yes, yeah, here at Zim Data, it's a fundamental part of what we do. It, you know, again, we're built on top of Spark. Um, it's a really important part of what you know our architecture. Um, and then when it comes to these streaming engines, you know, a lot of those are open source. So again, I mentioned things like Apache Kudu. Anything with a word Apache in front of it is open source. So you've got Apache Kudu. You've got um, Cassandra, uh, which is an Apache project as well. You've got HBase. And all of this, you know, most of these uh, streaming engines and high-performance uh, data stores are, are uh, ultimately open source. Now, they may have um, – oops, I clicked on that by mistake, I think. They may have uh, commercial companies behind, the, behind them as well, you know, where they're offering support and subscriptions and that kind of stuff, um, which is great because uh, it helps to support those, those uh, open source projects and it also enables, you know, commercial companies who – to rely on this technology to make sure they can get support and they can get, get updates and so on. So that's a really important part of the, the overall market. I love it. Well, folks, so we went through a whole hour here. Thank you very much for your time and attention. We do archive all these webcasts, so feel free to come back later. They usually go up in about a day. And with that, a big thank you to Ian Fife of Zoom Data and, of course, Mark Madsen from Third Nature. We love these conversations, and I know I'm always learning new things from these guys it's a brave new world. It's exciting stuff. And uh, watch for more from Zoom data and streaming analytics. We'll catch up to you next time, folks. Take care. Bye-bye.